Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. This is the BSI Consumer Forum Conference. It's the second of our conferences. And uh, of course, as you will know, it is the first time that we've gone digital with our conference. I'm Liz Barclay, and I'm the chair of the Consumer Forum. And I'm very pleased to be chairing today's conference. Um, welcome to you all. Um, and those of you who know and interact with the forum already uh, will know what we're all about. But those of you for whom this is the first encounter, I will tell you more. And given the year that we've had so far, the contention of this conference is that consumers are living online in 2020 to an extent neither expected nor planned for. And so the potential for detriment needs to be addressed. And that's what we'll be discussing as we go through this afternoon. Now, just to say a little bit further about the BSI uh, Consumer Forum before we go any further, the forum is basically made up of three parts. There's the council, there's the conference, and there's the ongoing relationship with BSI. And the council is a group of people representing a whole range of consumer oriented organizations across the UK, uh, everyone from which Age UK, Citizens Advice, the Royal Society for the Pre Prevention of Accidents, the Chartered Institute of Trading Standards, uh, Electrical Safety First. There's a long and distinguished list of organizations that sit round the forum table and we're aiming to add to that list uh, as we go on, because the purpose of Council is to bring together people with foresight, insight, research and evidence, which will help us to form a strategy, give us an, the expertise to recognise uh, where we need to influence BSI to put in effort to make sure that consumers are protected by standards. And one essential element of the Council is CPIN and that's the Consumer and Public Interest Network. Now, the chair of CPIN, Julie Hunter, is a member of the council. You'll be hearing from Julie this afternoon as part of uh, the, our panel discussion. And uh, CPIN is that network of technical experts who sit on technical committees uh, in BSI, helping with the standards development and setting. And Julie's presence is at the Consumer Forum Council table allows her then access to the strategic thinking and the background expertise of all of those council members that I've just been talking about. So that in turn helps her prioritise her annual work plan. So we all work together and the work of council is reported directly to BSI through the SPSC, which is the Standards Policy and Strategy Committee. Um, and that uh, I report directly to them. Uh, so I am the voice of the consumer around that table and they are my conduit, they are our conduit to the BSI board. So the annual conference is our opportunity to talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing and some of the work that we are planning. And I hope that um, I've given you a flavor of how the consumer is represented and taken very seriously in BSI. And uh, I think it's safe to say that BSI does hear uh, from us frequently on what we see as the needs of the consumers. So this is the conference and it is short and sweet. This is the third uh, leg of that three legged stool, so to, to speak. COVID-19, I think, has really accelerated uh, the adoption of digital technology by consumers. Uh, and of course, by companies, by employees, we are becoming more digital, more virtual, but we uh, are where we might have expected to have been in perhaps five, maybe even 10 years time. And that has brought a whole range of opportunities. It's given more people access to goods and services that they might have been excluded from previously, such as being able to see a GP without having to wait for an appointment or being able to attend virtual events like this previously out of reach. But there is the other side to that coin, of course. And as a result of the pandemic, consumers have had to adapt quickly to do everything from shopping and banking to healthcare and communication, um, working from home and holding events like this. And for many, it hasn't been a choice. 
Others simply haven't had the infrastructure or the existing skills to change seamlessly. And many have struggled to do those things like the online GP appointment, the paying the bills, getting food delivered. Many have simply been excluded by the change and the rapidity of that change. So the rapid in increase in online activity has exacerbated existing vulnerabilities, created new ones, and made people who've never otherwise been in that situation vulnerable to change and to the speed of change. Consumers in vulnerable circumstances who may have had very little experience of the internet or digital services before the lockdown are now amongst those likely to need its services. And this has put consumers at risk from a new range of potential harms. Scams are absolutely rife at the moment. My inbox is filled every day with warnings from various uh, banking entities like UK Finance, from the FCA, and from uh, other organisations warning of the scams that people may befall. Um, UK Finance warned this morning to beware of goods on offer that don't exist, where payments will be made, purchases will fail to turn up because they don't exist in the first place and there's no way to get the money back. And those scammers are targeting Christmas shoppers, mostly those who are shopping online for this Christmas for the first time. So the rapid acceleration to digital and online has shone a light on existing gaps in consumer protection too. There are 2 million people in the UK dependent on cash. There are 8 million people in total who can't completely move to a cashless society. Yet banks are closing branches, removing ATMs because people are using less and less cash. How do we protect access to cash for those who will need it for many years to come? And that's just one of the many examples that the speakers uh, will raise this afternoon. How can we protect consumers in global online marketplaces and help businesses to respond better and quicker to increased demand from a diverse range of virtual consumers? And beyond COVID, what will new trade deals throw up in terms of consumer protection? Protections are in danger of being eroded partly because of the speed of change. And what is the role in, of standards in setting and cementing protections into that fast changing system? So the Consumer Forum Conference 2020 will address increasing and changing vulnerabilities as we live more online, the issues of product safety in the virtual world, how to stop the erosion of consumer rights and protections as we rush pell-mell into digital and virtual transactions and interactions. And I do hope that you enjoy the session. Please do add your questions and your comments to the Q&A part of the platform, and I will do my best to make sure that some of those questions get answered. So let me introduce our first speaker. Alex Neal has been the CEO of Resolver since December 2019. And she previously spent more than a decade at the Consumer Champion, which, where she held senior roles such as uh, Managing Director of Home Products and Services. Now, Resolver is the largest consumer complaints website in the UK and has dealt with more than 6 million cases since launching. Um, Alex, can we uh, get you up on the screen? Uh, it would be great to be able to see you. So if you could uh, click on your video, that would be absolutely terrific. And um, let's uh, see what you let's see what you can tell us about virtual life for, for consumers in 2020. <laughs> um, what's it like? <laughs> Thanks, Liz. Yeah, I mean, uh, as you say, we resolve we have sort of quite a bit of experience in dealing with consumers who have complaints and we work right across the economy. So we take complaints from everything, including public services. So government services like the DBLA, right to banking, shopping, um, deliveries, um, anything you could really imagine. So um, we have seen the, the full the full um, impact of COVID, particularly over the last um, six months. And it's, it's been fascinating, obviously, since, since being at Resolver to look at how how our complaints have really changed over that period when everybody has been forced into a situation of doing everything online. Um, you know, during the last sort of six months, we've had over half a million complaints. 
Um, and actually, it's quite interesting because that's only really up by about 10% on the previous six months. So I think a lot of people anticipated that there's been a lot more complaining, a lot more sort of activity. But I think what we've seen is what I would call more of a displacement effect. So we've seen that people have transferred out of some areas. Um, some sectors have seen drops in complaints, obviously things like restaurants when they've been closed. Um, and actually in other areas like banking, um, we've seen a little drop in complaints. But what we've seen is a big growth in some of those kind of main areas. So shopping has been responsible for huge increases in complaints. Um, and so has um, travel, the travel sector, which will come as no surprise, and then clearly deliveries. Um, so what we've really seen is in general, the volumes have been there or thereabouts a little bit higher than perhaps of normal. But but actually what's happened is then below the surface. So when you get into you know, the particular sector and then the categories. So if you look at something like travel, for example, what we previously see is very high complaints for things like delays, so flight delays. Why that shifted is obviously delays in, um, in terms of flight cancellations and actually into travel agents. So we've seen a big growth in complaints about travel agents during this period. In um, something like deliveries, we've just seen a huge growth in people having complaints about either things being delivered, not being delivered, or, or the delivery service that they're trying to access. Um, again, as, as you'd, it's quite obvious you'd imagine that. And then in, in terms of shopping, you know, normally we would see really high complaints um, actually in in in-store experiences, and that's moved into obviously online and again into deliveries in those sectors. Um, Alex, and, have you uh, have you seen any change in the in the people who've been making complaints? Yeah, you know, uh, just as well as the nature of complaints. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I'd say where we have seen the impact is in the, the search volume. So the number of people coming to our website and, and that activity has really been driven by, and the growth there has been driven by the over 65s. We've seen a 25% increase in um, the over 65s using our site and they're using it in a slightly different way to perhaps, you know, a normal user of Resolver. They're using it as the directory. And what we have found is that as companies have whipped down their contact details or changed the methods of which you could contact them people are landing on our site to try and find those phone numbers to try and find the email addresses that suddenly all disappeared um during covid i think what we have why was that <laughs> yeah well i think there's i think there's a various sort of reasons for that but it's a growing trend actually that was happening before covid this i guess what we term as companies that make it hard to complain um and what we have seen is that yes there was the inevitable period you know when covid first hit where everyone as you said at the top you know everyone's had to adapt to working and managing and living their lives online and and i think consumers gave companies a bit of respite and we saw that in our data so funnily enough we saw a little drop in complaints right as covid first hit where people said okay i'm just going to take a step back here and and what we saw in terms of our complaints were people were complaining only about things that were urgent or unavoidable um so that was the rush into you know things like delivery slots things like travel cancellation rights what we what we have seen now is is that you know people have started to lose a bit of patience actually with those, less forgiving <laughs> yeah with, with those businesses where covid i think there is a sense in some cases where covid feels like a bit of an excuse and a data point that i sort of give to it to sort of highlight that would be in shopping so actually um, the customer service um, satisfaction measures within retail have held pretty steady you know they're fairly high until we got to the summer and then we've seen that actually consumers have started to you know down rate their experiences of shopping and i think that's probably mixed a mixed bag really of two things one where they've returned to stores and felt like the experience hasn't been quite what they were expecting um, and the other piece is that people are still struggling with really, really basic things, either being able to complain and get in touch with somebody or actually to be able to access their rights. Um, you know, the two big types of complaints that we've seen during um, COVID have really been about accessing your basic statutory rights. So refunds or cancellations and then just getting in touch with companies. So of that half a million complaints, 260,000 of those complaints contain some sort of text or some sort of information from the consumer that, that indicates they've had a problem getting hold of that company. 
So that is is quite incredible, incredible, really, when you think it's it is the basic to be able to talk to a company. Um, and that's the yeah, companies were making a lot of effort before COVID to understand their customers because they wanted to know them, they wanted to personalise the service. Um, then, of course, there was a mad rush to get everybody working from home. And, uh, you know, and there, there probably was a hiatus there where it was pretty difficult to allow customers to contact you because actually you weren't fully up and running. But, um, you know, has that changed? Has this set the agenda back? Or, or do you think that once we get... Um, you know, back to a slightly more normal way of working, whatever that might be, hybrid or whatever, that that companies will start on that personalization route again. I think so, but I'd also probably say it's it's right at the moment for them to probably focus back on the basics because the data that we see and the evidence that we've got at the moment is that those things are the things that are damaging consumer confidence right now. So actually incredibly um, looking at our satisfaction data the sectors where consumers are saying you know that they're, they're actually increasing their satisfaction are, are with those more heavily regulated sectors so banking energy telecoms where really because of regulation and because of some of the things that the government and the regulators have, have, have sort of encouraged and or in some cases forced um, banks to do in particular, they've actually seen massive increases in satisfaction during this period. And I think that's really interesting when you normally would say, okay, the sectors that do really well for customers wanting to engage and enjoying engaging are much more kind of retail type sectors and, and potentially the travel industry. And actually, I think it is right at the moment that companies do sort of focus back in on the basics because service seems to be really, really struggling and actually some innovation you know, really putting your innovation efforts into delivering great service, I think would be really welcome for consumers. And the other piece, which is quite worrying, I think, and, and, and you know, others will address later is on, is getting back to standards and getting back to basics around delivering rights. Um, we seem to be struggling, um, you know, for consumers to be able to access basic things like cancellations and refunds. Um, again, you know, it's obvious in things like travel that we could see clearly that's what most people were trying to do, urgently trying to get that refund and sort out their flights and their accommodation and all the rest of it. But interestingly enough, as the time has gone on, we've seen that term spike in other sectors. So actually, it's not just in the travel industry where people are having a problem getting a hold of someone to cancel something or get a refund. We're seeing that in other areas, clearly where people are trying to cling on to direct debits. And yet consumers are starting to do some of that housekeeping behavior where they're tightening their belts and they're wanting to cancel subscriptions, for example. Um, and that's not as it's still not as easy as it should be. Um, you may have noticed that there is a, a poll question that has popped up. I should have said that you, these will pop up um, as the speakers uh, are speaking and we will report back uh, on the answers uh, later on uh, before the panel session. Um, but one thing, um, this that question is, has your business recognised uh, a change in customers in vulnerable circumstances during the pandemic? One question that I'd like to uh, end with you, uh, Alex, is... I'm conscious of this. To what extent do you think digital transformation is exacerbating the problems of exclusion uh, for yeah. certain customers? It's, it, it's really interesting because, again, if you look at the top level data, the number Resolver um, tracks 16 different types of situational vulnerability in its, in its, in its complaints. And it does that by analyzing both um, you know, what the user is telling us and the, and the words that they're using and the descriptions in their complaint. Now, what we've seen actually at the top level is that broadly speaking, the level of vulnerability is, is, is the same as it was pre-COVID. So, you know, it can sit anything between 20 to 25 percent of all complaints we would say have got or talk, have some markers of vulnerability. But actually, when you dig below the surface of that, you can see a slightly different picture, which, again, is this shift into sectors. And unfortunately, particularly retail and shopping seems to be an area where we saw a big spike in people um, with vulnerabilities to do with their age, to do with mental health and to do with general health issues where we've seen, um, you know, access and, and particular concerns 
um, coming up time and time again. Um, so, so I do think um, there are certain sectors who, again, perhaps maybe due to the lack of regulation, etc., haven't quite um, sorted out um, some of the access um, issues. But I would say that I think um, it's interesting to see that. I did look into whether you know having access to the internet and things like that have been that's one of the things that we we track and that's not really peaked at any point during covid as well so clearly um the telecoms industry have done a good good job of um, keeping the show on the road there i think so it shows it can be done well alex um unfortunately where did the 10 minutes go <laughs> Uh, we should have allowed double that, but thank you ever so much indeed for joining us. Um, and perhaps you'll come back and tell us, because I think that there will be probably a bigger shift as we go over the next 12 months than there even has been in the, pa the past 12 months. So it would be really interesting to have you back uh, to tell us a bit more about what you are seeing over the 12 months that come. Um, Alex Neil from Resolver, thank you very, very much indeed for joining thank us. Thank you, Liz. Great to see you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, now, uh, I have the great pleasure to introduce our expert panel. We have three panelists. We have uh, Chris Fitch. We have, uh, uh, sorry, Chris Fitch is vulnerability lead at the Debt Charity Money Advice Trust. We have uh, Nina Barty, who is head of campaigns at WITCH, and Julie Hunter, who is the aforementioned chair of CPIN. The panelists have each been given 10 minutes uh, in which to state their case. And then I'm going to bring them together to address your questions, your comments and your experiences. So please do feel free to put your comments in the chat as we go through the session. Um, and there will be further poll questions. They'll pop up during the presentations. We'll uh, gather up your responses. I'll report back before the discussion starts. Uh, and I will hope to put some of your questions to the panel. So let's start with Chris Fitch. Uh, Chris is a research fellow at the University of Bristol and vulnerability lead, as I said, at the Money Advice Trust. He leads a programme of award-winning research and intervention work on consumer vulnerability. And to date, Chris, uh, Chris's programme has undertaken work on vulnerability with more than 300 firms and uh, 30,000 staff across financial services essential uh, services, retail and government sectors. Now that is quite a list. Uh, Chris, <laughs> over to you. <laughs> thanks very much, Liz, and thanks, um, Conference. So yeah, so I'm from uh, Money Advice Trust. They run National Deadline and Business Deadline. So we encounter a huge number of people there who are vulnerable to some form of harm. I also at the uh, University of Bristol Personal Finance Research Centre, and we take on commissioned work around um, consumer uh, vulnerability. So what I want to do is I'm going to talk about vulnerability and the, uh, the virtual uh, consumer. And I am going to try and answer three questions for you. If I can just move aside then. So um, firstly, kind of who is the virtual consumer and what does vulnerability mean in that context? Um, secondly, what are they vulnerable to? And is he, there's a long list and some of my fellow panelists will uh, dig into this as well. But I'm going to present uh, three things that I think are absolutely fundamental. And how can we prevent this? I'm going to try and leave you with some practical things that you uh, can do today, tomorrow, rather than get into longer term debates about policy uh, and other forms of change. These are practical things. And if you're interested in any things that we do, just simply search in Google or even Bing, if you're using that, uh, for vulnerability matters, and you'll be able to get all of the resources that I mentioned today. So who is the, uh, the virtual consumer? Well, the first virtual consumer, arguably, was Mrs. Jane Snowball. And there she is, from Jane from Gateshead. And uh, 1984, so um, I was running the world, Mrs. Jane Snowball was uh, ordering products from uh, Greg's, Tesco, and the chemist using a system called Videotext that was invented uh, at the end of the 70s by Michael Aldrich. So th th these aren't new issues when we talk about virtual consumers. Virtual consumers have been around for a long time, and Jane Snowball was uh, leading uh, the charge there way before the internet was invented uh, in a closed user group, uh, a shopping system, but she was a virtual consumer. Now, 
we had the invention of the internet in 84 and we had Amazon, of course, really kind of uh, uh, setting a footprint down in terms of what we were likely to see there. So e-commerce was really taking off and there's the very first Amazon consumer, another virtual consumer buying the, uh, the fascinating sounding book, Fluid Concepts and Creative Analogies, the very first thing sold on Amazon.com. So virtual consumers have been uh, consuming not just kind of uh, Greg's, Tesco's and the chemist products, but it expanded outwards of e-commerce. And we've seen a lot since then. And we've seen new platforms for shopping and paying. So PayPal in 99, uh, the Facebook, as it was called back in 2004, really important um, uh, platform now in terms of shopping, uh, promotion, advertising. We had Kickstarter in 2009. So you could not only uh, uh, buy products, you could pay for them to be developed. And then we got things like Klarna coming along, uh, buy, buy now, pay later, many, many firms following that route. And of course, the end of 2019, uh, beginning of 2020, we've had coronavirus. And that's brought new people into the into the virtual loop. And we see this intersection of virtuality and vulnerability. Uh, I've got up there the kind of the vulnerable customers for delivery uh, aspect, new people coming online to try and get access to goods and services. And it's just really interesting. I took this from the Financial Times. And from an e-commerce perspective, uh, you know, some might even say that COVID-19 has brought 2030 to 2020. We've seen a mass acceleration there, more virtual customers, but with old and new problems uh, surfacing. So what does vulnerability mean in this context? I think this is really, really important to kind of nail down. We use the term vulnerable consumer quite a lot, but what does it actually mean? It's, and it's easy to get lost in definitions, regardless of your sector. And I put a few up there from the sectors that we work with quite regularly, but there are others and there are other trade association definitions as well. It's, it's easy to get lost in the definition. We get lost in what is vulnerability, but what's absolutely critical, and it's a good habit to get into, is to ask what is the virtual customer actually vulnerable to? What harm, what loss, what disadvantage? What are we specifically talking about? Because we can end up talking about vulnerable uh, consumers until the cows come home, but be talking about very different things. And often people use it as shorthand for people falling into particular population or risk group, uh, like people with mental health problems or the elderly. But what makes me vulnerable is, uh, is not the same as what I'm vulnerable to. And I think that's really important to bear in mind. So we need to think about things uh, in the virtual environment in terms of vulnerability that make it harder to do specific things. And again, this is about just being specific about vulnerability. So these could be things that make it harder to, um, since that poll's come up, I can't bring it, okay. Fairly choose products, purchase products, access them, use, uh, talk with a, a customer services representative, complain about products, pay for products or services or benefit from a product or service. These are things that make it harder. That's, these are the things at the top in the funnel that make us perhaps vulnerable. And this is what they make us vulnerable to. Or they could be things that are not directly related to a product or service, but where a customer is experiencing harm and either the firm can help them or external support is needed. If you want to find out any more about what vulnerability means, do have a look at some of the things that we provided. So what, let's, let's boil it down now. What are they vulnerable to? There's a huge list, but I picked three. This little thing here, we see this at the bottom of most websites, the accessibility statement, usually accompanied with some very positive graphics, maybe a sunflower pointed towards the sun. But actually accessibility is one of the huge issues that we face in the UK. I put out some stats there from the WebAIM project and the ClickAway Pound, which is around disability. Uh, WebAIM Aim found that in the top 1 million websites in the world, 98% uh, had accessibility issues under the web content access guidelines. The ClickAway Pound found that, you know, 7 million disabled people online in the UK, 69%, 7, 7 out of 10 consumers report clicking away if something isn't accessible. And these are familiar things to us in terms of vulnerability in the virtual consumer, perhaps. But a lot of the time, we, we, we've not got to the grips with them. And in particular, two things just to highlight here. And one is cognitive disability or people who are uh, vulnerable to access due to a cognitive uh, impairment, learning disability, mental health problem, often overlooked. We need to uh, reestablish that. And many people, of course, digitally excluded. So there's, there's one thing. Second thing in terms of virtual environments and vulnerabilities, losing track and losing control. Um, research done here by uh, Money and Mental Health, uh, the cost of convenience just came out last week, well worth reading. It's easy 
online um, services, products, platforms to lose track of what you've spent. Constantly clicking just a few buttons and before you know it, you spent a few hundred pounds. What's really interesting about this research they did is that 58% of people who had a mental health problem um, agreed that it was very easy to lose control of spending. Actually, 46% of the wider population uh, also had this. So people without mental health problems. So this is about designing uh, for people uh, with vulnerability in mind. But actually, it benefits all of us. And of course, you know, we've also found that the way in which uh, sites are um, uh, presented can lead us to kind of purchase more than we've, uh, we might want to. And third thing, I think, which is a real challenge is around our needs are unknown often on virtual uh, sites. So here's a, a journey. This is seen as one of the most efficient journeys for onboarding people onto new products and services. So it's only got four steps. You're welcomed, it's confirm your identity, check your information and congratulations, you've got the product. However, this means that we don't find out what consumers are vulnerable to or what their support needs might be. So what can we do to prevent this? Well, in terms of accessibility, I think it's really important to recognize the role that standards play, both the BSI standards, but there's two here I want you to go and have a look at, which I think are really helpful. The COGA standards, just search COGA standards in Google, are all about cognitive impairment, learning disability, mental health problems, autism. How can we design virtual environments with these people in mind? And in terms of all channel engagement, so not just thinking about digital, but making sure other channels open up if people struggle to use virtual, mental health accessible for money and mental health. Do take a look. The second thing is around control. Now, there's been a huge amount of work around vulnerability taking place in financial services and elsewhere, and we're really lucky to benefit from some of the thinking and some of the work around gambling could be really very helpful in terms of the controls that uh, consumers are allowed to place on their spending, who they spend with, how much they spend, their spending limits, cash withdrawals, and introducing friction into the process of consumption. And finally, of the three things I think we can do to prevent uh, vulnerability, we've seen this journey before earlier on, needs unknown. We don't know what consumer support needs are because we're making the journey so slick and efficient. However, what if we just added two simple steps to this? So after we've got the product or service, we've been welcomed on board as a customer, we simply inquire about additional need. So you're welcomed, thank you, your product's been approved. Now, is there anything extra in terms of support needs you might like to share with us? And you can find out more about this in our vulnerability and GDPR guidance, disclosure environments. So three things, who is the virtual consumer? Well, we've addressed, they've been around for a long time. We've addressed that vulnerability is vulnerability to what? We've outlined the three things they can become vulnerable to, and we've outlined how we can prevent this. If you want to know more, please look at the Money Advice Trust website. And I look forward to hearing the rest of the panelists and receiving your questions as we proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, barnstorming as always. <laughs> Thank you ever so much. And uh, um, please don't disappear because we do want to talk to you. Uh, on the panel. So thank you. Terrific. Let me introduce uh, Nina Bato, who is Head of Campaigns at Witch, tackling the big consumer issues of the day and securing changes to improve the lives of consumers across the UK. And in Nina's five years at Witch, she has campaigned on issues affecting consumers in product safety, digital utilities, public services and financial markets. Um, Nina, are consumers safe online? Thank you very much, Liz. Um, so, hello, I am Nina Barty. I'm the head of campaigns at Witch, the UK's largest consumer organisation. And our mission is to make life simpler, fairer and safer for all consumers. Um, we do this by providing independent and impartial advice directly to consumers and by working with businesses, regulators and policymakers to affect positive change across the UK. So over the last three years, we've been looking into the issues affecting consumers in the digital age, with the increased use of online marketplaces to buy products um, and to research and consume information online, as well as the growth of digital advertising. The shift to digital has brought huge benefits for people, including greater convenience and connectedness, um, as well as more choice. However, we also know that there are several harms that consumers face online. And in particular, our main areas of focus cover the sale of unsafe products, 
the rise in misleading and fake online reviews, and the growth in increasingly sophisticated online scams, including fake adverts. Now, in order to understand these harms online, the impact they and the impact that they have on consumers, and to inform our recommendations, we have con uh, conducted a program of product testing, investigations, and consumer research across a number of online platforms and marketplaces, including Amazon, Google, Facebook, eBay, Wish.com, and AliExpress. So, I'm going to start um, with some findings. Let's see if I can move this. There we are. Um, Going to start with some findings from extensive consumer research we have conducted over the last few years to better understand people's behavior, perceptions, and views on online issues. So online marketplaces have become a common way for millions of shoppers to buy online from an expanding pool of global sellers. Nine in 10 people have bought consumer goods in this way in the last year. People most value lower prices and wide choice that these marketplaces can offer, but consumer protections have failed to keep pace and fall short of more traditional retailers. Many research participants in our work saw online marketplaces as indistinct from online retailers and were often conflating the two and describing them as just shopping online. Many use the names Amazon and Amazon Marketplace interchangeably. And so in both of these cases, this suggests that online shoppers do not see a distinction between different types of retailers and marketplaces, and with that, the different consumer rights which apply. Social media sites continue to be seen as predominantly a social networking space, but increasingly people are engaging in commercial activities on these platforms. 43% of Facebook users click on ads and 45% buy or sell products while on the platform. So while online platforms have become even more important in 2020, shopping, working and socialising online has dramatically increased, increased due to the current pandemic, with many people going online for the first time. Our research has shown that more than half of UK adults now acknowledge they wouldn't be able to get through the things that they need to do every day if they didn't use the internet. And Ofcom has reported in April by April 2020, at the height of the lockdown, of the first lockdown, UK adults were spending an average of over four hours a day online, up from just three and a half hours just eight months previously. And our quick survey of our own membership has showed that 53% have spent more time browsing the internet since the start of lockdown, 38% said that their use of social media has increased, and 40% have been doing more online shopping. So, Online marketplaces such as Amazon Marketplace and eBay are becoming increasingly popular ways of buying products. However, the protections that consumers can expect when they are when they buy through more traditional retail outlets or websites have not kept pace when it comes to marketplaces, including in relation to product safety, which testing has repeatedly found a range of unsafe products for sale on the site. This includes toys with the levels of toxic chemicals that breach EU safety limits by seven times, smoke and CO alarms that have failed to detect smoke and CO, and USB chargers that pose a fire or electrocution risk. In fact, working with European partners, we have found high rates of safety failures with two thirds of the 250 products across 18 product categories purchased from the site's failing safety tests. While listings are often taken down when flagged to the sites, Within days, we found identical listings quickly reappearing, and this occurred three times with unbranded dangerous smoke alarms and child car seats already flagged to the marketplace. We've also found banned products on sale, for example, a number of toys listed on the EU Safety Gate database, and car seats sold by unapproved sellers and therefore illegal to be sold in the UK. There are often mixed responses from across platforms, but it appears that little action is taken to prevent unsafe products being listed in the first place. There are also concerns that buyers are not being informed about product recalls or safety issues with items that they have purchased. Our research has shown that only one in five of UK online marketplaces, uh, place users are unaware that online marketplaces have no legal responsibility for the safety of the items available on their sites. 70% of users thought that the law should change to make this a legal responsibility, and 90% thought that the marketplace should be either solely or jointly involved in product recalls. So on to fake reviews. Online reviews are becoming ever more important to consumers' buying journeys. 
Our research shows that 97% of consumers consult reviews when purchasing products online, and over three in four trust that online customer reviews are genuine. In 2015, reviews contributed to over £23 billion worth of consumer spending in the UK, and we know that online reviews can make or break a business. However, the role of reviews uh, risks being severely undermined by misleading information. Our investigations have found many rogue sellers and dishonest businesses resorting to tactics such as bribery, hacking, and gaming platform systems to post fake reviews and mislead shoppers, penalizing good and honest firms. And we know that these fake reviews are successful in misleading people. A witch behavioral experiment found that shoppers are twice as likely to buy a poorer quality product if there are fake reviews present. We've also found platforms own systems and activities can exacerbate the problem. Review hijacking is made possible through platforms allowing reviews for dormant listings to be merged with unrelated new listings or products to share the same reviews. And online sites own use of reviews to inform search rankings and endorsement algorithms also incentivize sellers to gain the system. 45% of shoppers said that they were more likely to purchase a product um, from Amazon with the Amazon Choice badge. Yet we have found numerous examples of products with the Choice logo and evidence of fake reviews. On to online scams. Now, scams and fraud are the most prevalent type of crime in the UK, causing significant financial and emotional harm. Online platforms, including social media sites and search engines, are playing a growing role in enabling criminals to reach and defraud internet users. Consumers face a staggering range of scams when navigating the digital world, while fraudsters are increasingly using sophisticated tactics and guises to target victims. Recent witch investigations have found impersonator ads appearing in Google search results for the debt charity Step Change, insurance and investment firm Aviva, and financial technology company Revolut. And while we find that it only took hours to post fake ads in Google, um, and while in our own investigations, we have found that it can take only hours to post fake ads on Google and Facebook, revealing a lack of effective controls on the sites. In one case, we, we created two fake companies that offered fake, um, that offered pseudo health and hydration advice to expose how easy it is for fraudsters to create and promote false adverts. In one case, in Google has just required advertisers to have a Gmail account to create adverts. And while it did review adverts submitted, it did not verify if the business was existed was legitimate, nor did it ask for proof of ID. On Facebook, we created and paid for the promotion of a fake business and were able to target our audiences. For example, we were able to target females aged 18 to 65 with interests in health and well-being, water and extreme weight loss. And on Google, it was possible to target users who used who search for terms such as eczema treatment, high blood pressure and suicide. Our further research and investigations have found that platforms' responses to dealing with scam ads have predominantly focused on reporting tools that rely on users to spot and report scam content. Worryingly though, our recent research has shown that just three in 10 Facebook users in our survey so that they were aware of the scam ad reporting tool introduced by the site in 2019. And only a third of these, 10% overall, said that they, that they had used the tool themselves. So what, okay. So what are our findings here? So through this work, we have identified several common issues. Firstly, each of these harms are per perpetrated through illegal content and activity posted by bad actors on these sites. It is illegal to write fake reviews, sell unsafe products or defraud people. Secondly, the limited legal responsibilities of online marketplaces and platforms for the content on their sites have led to the following issues. Marketplaces fail to bring in preventative measures to identify and effectively address harms on their sites made known to them. While often quick to respond when informed, reactive measures to deal with harmful content once it has been made on the site are inconsistent and ineffective and often do not lead to an overall reduction in harm. There is little transparency about the responsibilities of marketplaces and therefore consumers often believe that platforms have responsibility to keep them safe and have undertaken preliminary checks on the content on their sites. 
and often online platforms fall between the gaps of regulatory frameworks, which has led to the emergence of these online harms, but with little regulatory oversight and enforcement to effectively deal with them. Ultimately, we believe that with the growing role that online marketplaces and platforms play in people's daily lives, new responsibilities and regulatory frameworks are needed to ensure healthy digital markets so that con consumers can continue to benefit from these sites. Online platforms must be required to do more to prevent these harms from occurring in the first place. While there are some instances of sites taking proactive measures and initiatives, such as the EU's Product Safety Pledge, we do not find that voluntary action has been adequate to address the harms people face. The legal obligations of sites must be clarified with online platforms, giving greater responsibility to introduce proactive and reactive measures to prevent and tackle harm, and greater transparency obligations so consumers are actually aware of the site's responsibilities. Regulators must also be able to effectively enforce these changes and be empowered to hold platforms and bad actors on them to account if they fail to keep their users safe. For example, to ensure people are better protected when shopping online, online marketplaces should be given greater risk legal responsibility for ensuring the safety of the products sold on their sites. The actions required by online platforms when harmful content is identified should also be clarified, including quick action to remove it and giving online marketplaces responsibility for overseeing product reports. There is now a an opportunity for the UK government to take sensible and proportionate steps to address the clear gaps in our consumer protection and safety frameworks to ensure that people can continue to enjoy the many benefits of being online, particularly as these days they have very little choice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina. Uh, just before you go, there's a very, uh, not that you're going anywhere, but uh, there's a very, very short question on the chat that says, uh, sorry, on the Q&A that says, who are the people who tend to produce fake reviews and ads? Can you answer that in, in one short sentence? Yes. So there, there are, we know that there are unscrupulous sellers out there who can themselves uh, generate fake reviews, um, writing them themselves or incentivizing um, their own uh, genuine customers to write um, fake positive reviews. But we also know that there is a whole industry of fake review factories out there. So they will actually sell bulk fake reviews to sellers who might be looking to inflate their overall star ratings. We found these being um, advertised on um, platforms such as Google, but also um, Facebook has been working with the regulator to deal with um, the trading of fake reviews within Facebook groups. Um, so we know that there is a big industry here and you can buy a fake review for as little as um, a pound a pop. Um, and it's a really big issue that the um, the CMA is currently looking at to see how ah. our platforms are dealing with this on their sites. There's a market for everything. Um, yeah. Nina, stay with us for the panel session. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, let me introduce Julie Hunter now. Of course, I've mentioned Julie already. She's the chair of the Consumer and Public Interest Network, CPIN, an independent body that represents consumers in British standards. Uh, as CPIN chair, Julie's ambition is to unlock the full potential of standards as a consumer protection tool, helping organizations to improve outcomes for consumers and reduce the risk of harm. So Julie, over to you. Um, thanks for the introduction, Liz. Yes, um, I'm just gonna talk for my 10 minutes about how consumers are protected in the online world and what role standards can play in that. So we've talked a lot about the rapidly changing world that we're living in. And um, living online has created a whole new complex world of challenges, not just for consumers, but also those who protect them. So we've heard about quite a few of those today from um, previous speakers. So difficulty in making decisions based around fake reviews, for example, unfair treatment for vulnerable consumers, um, unsafe goods uh, and things like threats to privacy and security are also big issues. Um, and this has led to a new wide range of harms that can be caused. And I think the big and obvious thing here is that consumers obviously need um, more protection than ever in this rapidly changing and different world. So before we look at existing protection, 
um, for online consumers. I think it's important to think about how this environment is different to a face-to-face -face interaction with, with a business and how it's changing consumer behaviour, experiences and needs. And I believe consumers are in a much weaker position when they're online for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, people behave very differently online. You can shop online anytime, anywhere, 24 seven. And one of the big things I think is the lack of friction in your shopping experience. Now, businesses want to make as little friction as possible. So it's easy as possible for you to spend your money. But I do think there needs to be some friction there. And one click purchases, buy now, pay later models um, are almost making it too easy for consumers to spend. And it's increasing the possibility of making mistakes, of maybe running up debt or um, poor outcomes and poor decisions. There's also a huge imbalance of power. You can't see the trader or the business face to face. You can't try on clothes. You can't check the quality of um, products. I heard a story the other day about someone who had bought something, an antique chair on eBay, and they thought they got a brilliant bargain because it was only hundred pounds. And then when it arrived, it was like a little itty bitty chair for a doll's house. <laughs> so that's a good example of, you know, how it's good if you can actually inspect things before you purchase. Um, and also with the imbalance of power, a major thing is that you usually are required to make payment before delivery of the product or service, um, which means you have to put all of your trust in the business to deliver on their promises. And if they don't, you have to then go through the hassle of trying to get your money back and resolve the problem. So I think both of these things illustrate that consumers need equal or even greater, I think, protection um, when they're online than when they're offline. And this is also an ambition of the United Nations Guidelines for Consumer Protection and the OECD Recommendations for Consumer Protection in e-commerce. So are consumers getting this equal or even greater protection online? Um, Julie, could I just uh, interrupt you there ever so briefly? Can uh, We've had a request for you to explain what you mean by friction. <laughs> well, it's things that make it slightly difficult for you to make a purchase. You know, for example, if you have to put in um, particular details or, you know, you have to go through several steps, basically, before you can make your purchase. Whereas things like one click purchase, before you know it, you've clicked on buy and the thing's arriving the next day. So um, it's just about things there to make you stop and think, are you sure you want to spend this money? It's the number of steps basically in the process, I'd say. Thank you. That's okay. So um, let's have a look at what's in the online consumer protection toolkit. Now um, we've got legislation obviously, and I've put a few things up there. Obviously there's a lot more legislation around that, but I've picked out three um, pieces of legislation that I think help to address some of the issues that were raised earlier. We've got the Consumer Rights Act, which covers products, services, and digital content. And it covers things like satisfactory quality, um, gives consumers a right to refund. Um, we've also got consumer contract regulations, which cover consumer information around the product descriptions, which are very important, um, trader contact details and costs, that kind of thing. And they also give you a right to cancel if you've bought something at a distance. Other things that are in the consumer protection kind of toolkit are international guidance. So the things from the UN and OECD that I just mentioned earlier. And then really importantly, we've got enforcement and redress. Now, these are really essential to consumer confidence. It's basically if everything goes wrong, do you have um, some way to put things right? Can you have confidence that they will be put right? Um, and without these, it's really pointless having the rules set out in the legislation because um, you, there's what's the point of having them if no one's making sure they're enforced or being followed. So we do have really good strong consumer protection legislation in the UK based mainly on EU directives but there are lots of challenges I think to applying it in the online environment. So just to run through a few of those, the way that legislation is developed historically is that it's been developed in silos. So you have, for an example, product safety legislation, then you have different legislation that deals with digital issues. 
and the two don't really meet. And we know that smart products, for example, these things are entangled in our everyday lives and they need to be addressed together. Um, so even though some recent legislation like Consumer Rights Act does include digital issues, there are still lots of gaps historically where these aren't addressed. Um, the speed and the pace of evolving tech means that legislation struggles to keep up. Um, but I think two of the main obstacles to um, legislation having an impact in the online world is around liability and jurisdiction. So liability, as Nina was saying, particularly with online marketplaces, but it's knowing who is responsible, you know, who are your rights against, who are you going to pursue to make sure that your rights are, are delivered. Um, and it's not just knowing who that person is or business is, it's finding them and having a satisfactory communication with them it can be very, very difficult online. You can't just go marching into the shop and, you know, demand to speak to the man manager and refuse to leave until they come out. Um, that doesn't happen when you're online. Um, it's also particularly complicated if things are happening cross border. And that's where jurisdiction comes in. We are living um, in a global world. Consumer markets are global. Um, and it means that a lot of the harms are also happening across border. The problem is that our consumer protection framework is national, mainly, sometimes regional, for example, European level. And it means that different laws may apply to the company you're transacting with that apply in your own country. You might not even realise you've you know, been transacting with someone that doesn't live in the UK or is not based in the UK. So there has, there's implications there around the rights that you have, depending on you know, where the company is based. It makes it very difficult to pursue a case and to pursue your rights. So for these reasons, I think it's really, really difficult for consumers to have these equal rights online. So there's one um, key thing um, that I didn't mention on the previous slide because it deserves a slide all to itself, which is standards. Um, standards are an essential tool in the consumer protection toolkit. And I think they have advantages over a lot of the other tools that I mentioned on the previous slide. In the absence of this like global legislative framework, international standards can harmonize business practice across borders. And also unlike other tools, um, there is an obligation to include the consumer. So consumers can actively participate in developing content. Um, and they have a right to be there and they have an equal voice because standards are developed by consensus. Um, there's also legislation really says what businesses must do, but standards say how. So they can provide the detail, making it easier for businesses to apply best practice. And they can also be quicker to develop and amend particularly PASs, which are publicly available specifications, and flex standards have a more agile process. So they're good for the digital environment because they can respond more quickly to changing consumer needs. Um, but for all of these great benefits, it's really, really vital that consumers are at the heart of standards if we're going to unlock their full potential as a consumer protection tool. So there are lots of benefits of consumer participation. It means that standards are robust they if you imagine all of the different stakeholders bringing their different perspective in it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle and it all fits together nicely when all of the different voices are heard and you can see the big picture um, it makes sure that standards address real problems that are faced by real people um, also if businesses understand consumer needs they can create products and services that are fit for purpose they can be safer fairer more accessible more sustainable and also if business businesses understand consumer needs they can improve efficiency and quality reduce complaints and that can help them to um, keep existing customers and win new ones if they can build that consumer trust and confidence it can boost their loyalty and reputation so really it's a win-win for consumers and um, businesses as well Okay, so what's CPIN's role in, in all of this? I've mentioned the um, consumer stakeholder group um, in standards, and it, that can include a wide range of consumer organisations. But it's really important to understand that CPIN is the only organisation that has specific remit and resource to represent consumers in British standards. So let's have a few like CPIN facts. 
Um, we were established in 1951 and made up of more than 60 volunteers who give up their valuable time to sit on standards committees um, to speak up for consumers. And I know many are on this call today, so just shout out to them now. Um, they're all experts in consumer issues and they're trained to think about the diverse needs of all consumers. And as Chris was saying, this is really important, understanding the needs of consumers and that kind of lived experience. So they bring um, the views of consumers of all ages, genders and abilities, and they also think about all foreseeable uses of a product or service. So that could be intended, unintended or malicious use, and that helps them to identify the key areas of harm and detriment that um, we want the standards to address. Something else that's really important is that um, CPIN operates completely independently from BSI. We have our own mission and vision, as you can see up here on the slide. Uh, we have our own strategy. And through the um, CPIN steering group, we make our own decisions about the standards work that we participate in. Um, we are supported by BSI and BAYS. Um, and without the consumer team um, at BSI, our work just simply wouldn't be possible. Um, so we focus on five priority areas that guide our work. And with two and a half thousand British standards being published each year, it's really important that we prioritise because we can't get involved in all of them unless we clone ourselves, which we talk about quite a lot in our meetings, <laughs> uh, if that was only possible. Um, but digital is one of our top priorities and we do a lot of work in this sphere now. It's a really big cross-cutting issue that's relevant to a rapidly increasing number of products and services. And to make sure we maximise CPIN's impact in this kind of fast-changing digital world, we push for future-proof standards. So we look at covering key principles, um, such as privacy by design, which is a new international standard that we're working on now, um, and principles such as vulnerability, inclusivity, um, ethics, um, and we also look at outcomes focused standards so that we're looking at the final outcome for the consumer rather than prescribing the exact methodology that should be used in many cases by businesses. So finally, I just wanted to talk about our collaboration with BSI's Consumer Forum. Um, Liz, you've already mentioned who the forum are and what they do, which is great. Um, CPIN is a member. And one thing that's really important to remember is that charities, <laughs> particularly now in COVID times, don't always have the time or resources to participate directly in standards development. I mean, they do, sometimes they do, but the, the great um, value of the forum is that we can collaborate with these organisations and um, share um, subject expertise, tap into their specialist knowledge and strengthen that consumer voice in standards. So, that's how we kind of strengthen that voice and how we make sure that CPIN is addressing, you know, the really important um, topical issues for consumers that are causing the most detriment in the online world. Um, if anyone would like to find out more about, about CPIN or the Consumer Forum, I've popped in the um, website address there. So please feel free to take a look at that. There's lots of free resources on there. And also we're always looking for new consumer reps, new consumer champions, um, who can help us keep up with the demand. So if anyone's interested in finding out more, please do let us know. Okay, thank you very much. Julie, thank you very much. Um, you can probably hear the passion coming through there for both consumers and for standards. And uh, just to give ourselves a plug, Julie, uh, just to say that you and I uh, took part in a podcast last week and uh, Sadie has put the details of where to find that podcast on the chat. So if you'd like to hear us talking about standards, uh, and how they have helped improve the lives of consumers in the UK, then please do uh, have a listen to that. Julie, um, the, the questions are flooding in on the Q&A, and I would suggest that you, Julie, Chris, and um, Nina, have a look, uh, get prepared to answer briefly, and we'll try to get as many questions through as we possibly can. Chris Fitch has just asked whether or not if you could clone this yourself, there would be a standard for that. But I would prefer it if you didn't address that one. Uh, 
<laughs> live. Uh, and in the meantime, let me just bring in briefly Dana Kissinger Matri, who has nearly 20 years' experience as Secretary of the ISO Committee on Consumer Policy and advocates for consumers' interests in standards to the ISO community and beyond through social media, newsletters, publications, distance learning tools, and events. Dana, can you give us briefly an international perspective? Hello, Liz, thank you very much. And hello, everybody. I'm, I'd be very pleased to do that. Let me just briefly introduce myself. Um, I'm the secretary of the ISO Committee on Consumer Policy. And um, yes, I've been involved uh, with uh, uh, this for the last um, 20 years. Oh, here we go, one second. Okay, so I thought before getting started that it would be interesting to uh, share a little bit of the context in which this is taking place. So um, I'd like to share a study that was undertaken by uh, the United Nations Committee on Trade and Development of what this online environment looks like uh, internationally. Uh, they did a study along with uh, an, a couple of organizations uh, specializing in e-commerce, including one based in Switzerland. And um, they came up uh, with some findings about these nine countries. Uh, so Brazil, China, Germany, Italy, Republic of Korea, Russian Federation, South Africa, Switzerland, and Turkey. And uh, what you can see um, in the light green is 2019. And in the dark green, um, the difference uh, of the number of the percentage of online shoppers making an online purchase in the past few months across the sectors. So uh, this is in spite of the fact that uh, uh, the overall amount of uh, online transactions actually went down uh, during uh, the pandemic uh, in many of these countries. So there was a, a big change and um, the highest growth was in developing countries. Uh, more women became uh, involved in this and it was higher amongst the more educated. And now more than a half of the 3,700 res respondents from nine countries shop online more frequently. And it looks like a permanent development. And I provided the website below where you can see this. And this just, then provides the context uh, to some of the solutions they came up. So I framed it as consumer concerns and international solutions um, because uh, there are fundamental needs and concerns that you've heard about uh, expressed so eloquently before. Um, and then there are international solutions to these problems. And um, I, I think also uh, Julie made a very, very good case for why international standards are so uh, important. Uh, just speaking to access and inclusion, um, ISO 22458 provides guidance to all organizations on how to identify consumers in vulnerable situations and how to develop, implement, and maintain policies and procedures for the organization to deal with vulnerable Per consumers. And this is important because it's difficult to know how to identify them and also how uh, to address uh, this concern. And then the second area where this is really important is uh, the integrity of e-commerce transactions. So um, recently ISO set up an entire technical committee on transaction assurance in e-commerce, uh, covering a wide range of areas. So uh, covering uh, uh, areas such as uh, access, uh, protection of online consumer rights, online disputes and resolution, and then even covering the safety area uh, by providing for uh, the availability of inspection result data, for example. And they're working on well, two standards at the moment on terminology and on principles and framework. 
Then there's a standard that's been around for quite some time, uh, uh, confirmed uh, recently after its last publication in 2013. Uh, it's quality management, customer satisfaction, guidelines for business to consumer electronic commerce transactions. And um, this is an important standard uh, because it provides guidance for the planning, designing and developing and implementing, maintaining and improving an effective and efficient business to consumer electronic transaction system within an organization. It can be used by all types of organizations and it provides a framework for a fair and effective business to consumer system uh, in order to improve consumer confidence and increase satisfaction. Finally, the third area I'd like to mention is uh, the area of informed choice as a, a basic consumer right. And uh, a few years ago, um, ISO uh, 20488 on online consumer reviews, principles and requirements for their collection, moderation and publication uh, was published. And um, uh, this really provides uh, requirements and recommendations for review administrators to apply in their collection and moderation and publication of online consumer reviews. Again, applicable to any organization and uh, also covering areas outside the platform itself, extending to the supplier, uh, third parties, independent third parties, and so on. And uh, it just provides a basic uh, uh, guidance and blueprint for monitoring um, the online consumer reviews. And finally, um, talking about the sharing economy, uh, there is a standard under development now um, uh, dealing with uh, the uh, principles terminology and principles for um, the sharing economy and hopefully should be able to address some of the issues that were raised earlier, such as the trustworthiness, safety requirements and provider verification. Uh, and this should address some of the uh, wide range of concerns that have come up uh, with these uh, sharing platforms, in addition to the question of transparent information, informed choice, and so on. So with these, I just wanted to provide a couple of uh, international solutions that are examples of the ways that uh, uh, international standards can address some of these consumer concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Dana, thank you. Uh, we're going to go to our panel session now. Just before we do that, uh, and obviously, Dana, if there are any questions on the international perspective, then we may very well call on your expertise. Um, but just before we, uh, while the panel's gathering themselves together, um, I would just like to have a quick look at the poll answers, if we can possibly do that, and just see uh, how we answered those questions that have been asked of you. Um, so the host is now sharing the poll results. Um, have you or your business recognized a change in consumers in vulnerable circumstances during the pandemic? Uh, I think 53% said people in vulnerable are vulnerable for different reasons now. And yes, I think that's what uh, I would have found. Can we have the, can we just keep the questions rolling through quite quickly and we'll uh, take the information. Uh, have you noticed or has your business made any changes in how you communicate with your uh, customers? 73% said yes, we've added in more channels. Um, and the next one. Uh, if your organization had money to invest in just one action to tackle vulnerability among virtual customers, what would it be? 75% said vulnerability design standards for all products and services. Yep. Standards, absolutely, there's a standard for everything. Uh, do you feel confident that the goods or services you access online are safe and secure as those you can access in the high street? And 68% said no. I think there are a couple more. Um, how do you think new trade deals after Brexit will affect our level of protection? 
we'll have less protection, say 75%, which is uh, rather worrying, I have to say. Um, I'm not sure if there's another one. Yes, one more. Uh, what is the biggest obstacle to using international standards in these areas? Lack of knowledge about standards, say 60%. And obviously, that's something that we actually um, touched upon right at the beginning. What about consumer awareness? And actually, what about even business awareness in lots of cases about standards as they exist? Okay, um, if our panel could, uh, our panel members could put their cameras on, that would be terrific. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Ashley Martin, who says, I'm all for better regulation and enforcement of online sites, but it's complex and it takes time. In the meantime, the products are out there and people are buying them. And given that the problems with all those problems with reviews, what's the best advice we can give to consumers now? Come on, Nina. Julie. In a word, you've got to unmute yourselves, though. <laughs> it's, it's a really good point, And we know change won't be slow in this area. One, it's very complex. Two, it's happening on an international level as well. Um, and therefore, you're absolutely right that we do have to think about how can we help people right now? I mean, the, the key thing is, is that people love being online and, you know, and getting the benefits from online, the choice, the convenience, um, all of the other, you know, the price as well. So we don't want to take that away from people. If you tell people today that you'll be taking away their Googles, their Amazons, their Facebooks, they would, you know, these are integral to their daily lives. But and because people are uh, really enjoy being on these sites, they don't necessarily know exactly the role of these platforms. And that's one of the biggest things we found was that there's a real gap in people's expectations for when they're on these sites and how much these sites are um, protecting them um, and the reality. So they go in with an overconfidence of, um, you know, that that content has already been screened, that they are, um, that they are all read, there's already been a filtering system so that whatever they see, they can trust. Um, and actually, it's taken a lot of investigation, lots of consumer research for us to figure out actually, what is it that is actually happening online? And how are people being misled or um, falling, um, you know, in, falling victim to some of these issues? Um, and why are we seeing such problems? Um, one of the things is that increased awareness, and that people need to understand that being online is different. The same regulations do not apply in the same way. They have to look at certain things. Um, so it's that smart um, aspect. Um, but there is a case of um, also telling people really there are certain things maybe you just shouldn't do online. Maybe you don't buy from you know what we've seen on online marketplaces, things like electricals um, or buying um, children's toys or things with chemicals in them um, from certain sites because we're seeing high failure rates. But, but the real challenge we have is, is that you don't want people to, bec uh, to become scared online. And so therefore it's how can you provide the tips that are to shop smart, shop safe, which is what we're really trying to do. How can you make people confident in the right way, looking out for the right things, and then being able to make a more informed decision about what they're doing online. So um, that's not going to stop everything though. What would you say then to the comment on the Q&A that says we just have to make sure that a website is genuine? That's that. I mean, that, that's a huge burden. I, I mean, I would probably say, is it how um, how reasonable is it to expect every individual who is online to be able to know whether a site is legitimate or a um, company is Julie, legitimate? Uh, I think, Julie, as you said, uh, you still have to have that interaction with them in order to get your money back. Yes, you do. And I think just wanted to reinforce my point that consumer protection legislation in the UK is good. It's one of the strongest in the world, that the European framework. Um, my point was really that it can be difficult to apply and to enforce your consumer rights online, not that they're not strong in the first place. And I think what Nina was pointing out, it's about not knowing who the trader is or not being able to you know, contact them. And it's not just about the website being genuine, it's, you know, even genuine companies don't respond to you. I mean, Alex said at the beginning, that's one of the main problems that they were seeing was that people just couldn't get through to the businesses. And if you can't make contact, then how can you apply your rights and get your problem resolved? So it, it's just more difficult to apply and enforce your rights online, I would say. OK, um, now I know we're going to take these uh, questions at quite some pace. Uh, there is a question for Chris. 
Your example of adding an extra question to the bank onboarding journey to identify support needs was interesting, but I imagine many consumers either don't see themselves as needing that kind of support or don't want to admit it. How can banks and other organizations identify and offer support for vulnerability if the person in question doesn't see themselves as needing support? Something you and I have discussed many times, lots of people don't want to be seen as or see themselves or be labeled as vulnerable. Okay, th uh, three things. Firstly, uh, there's 7 million disabled customers online, um, according to kind of research that we saw earlier in the presentation. Uh, they will know their needs. They will know what support uh, they require. But often they're not asked. I worked with one very large firm with tens of millions of customers who only had 8,000 registered disabled customers. So there, there, is, there is a group out there who can tell you what they need and would welcome that opportunity. Secondly, it's about making it clearer what you can do. People may not disclose or share their support needs because they think there's nothing that can be done. Um, so you need to send the right signals. Barclays Money Worries website is a great example that shows what will happen if you tell Barclays about everything from addiction to redundancy to bereavement. And thirdly, yeah, I think Kerry has a great point that not everybody wants to share that information. And that's why accessibility design standards are really key in this as well and need to be baked into products, services and customer journeys for those who don't disclose. Um, okay, a point from the chat that I just want to bring up. Um, as advice services have had to close face-to-face -face services, one group facing more barriers has been the Black and minority ethnic consumers with translation needs. Are there digital solutions to this? Does anybody know the answer to that? Because obviously that is um, a, a real area for detriment as we become more virtual. Chris, do you know if there's... I would, say, I would say that those with translation needs will have found out some of these solutions themselves. There's a mantra within disability rights, and I think it applies to all vulnerable consumers, is that uh, nothing about us without us. So my, my first port of call would be to ask those, those individuals. I'm sure there is a technology out there the same way as Signly or Be My Eyes is an equivalent in terms of translation and uh, guaranteeing an accuracy of quality. Um, but I couldn't tell you, Liz, what that was. And that just shows that we need to think about consumers. And I think France has got a great point, not as a monolith. We tend to talk about vulnerable consumers or consumers. Actually, there's a huge amount of diversity within them. And we need to recognize that in our analysis. Um, I just want to bring in this point, uh, the erosion of trading standards across the UK. Uh, there's a need for this limited resource to be strengthened and increased. How can this be achieved? I don't think this is particularly for this panel. Uh, but the, the next question then from David Smith is, uh, are we going to have a whole raft of new problems when we exit the EU fully at the end of the year? Who'd, who'd like to brave that one, Julie? <laughs> I don't know like is the right word. Um, it's a good question, David, and I think it's something that we've all been pondering quite a lot. And I don't know if we know all the answers even at this point. Um, we've been told that consumer protection legislation is, you know, is going to be transposed into UK law directly, word for word, and that we won't lose any of our rights. But what we don't know is how long it's going to stay like that. So we don't know what could happen to it after a certain period of time. What I think the real difficulty is with, with Brexit is the partnerships that we currently have with other European and international organisations in the areas such as product safety, like RAPEX um, enforcement agencies, and that communication and intelligence that is currently shared as to what the problems are, because we know that online problems are cross-border, um, things like European consumer centres, we don't really know yet how our relationship with those are going to continue. So I'd say very good point and one that we agree, I agree, but we don't really know the answers properly as yet we will <laughs> um can we just address ai technology ai technology is so advanced now that you can have almost instantaneous conversations and i suspect chris that's the answer also to the translation question it is uh, it is liz but it's um sorry to cut across you but the key thing there is the quality of the translation has to be proportionate to what you're trying to achieve so i think that's robert's right i think that if you're entering into a legal agreement contractual or there's a nuance or detail or you have to demonstrate the person doesn't lack uh, capacity or you're looking out for that then you need to be very careful about that quality and that's one of the reasons why uh, translation is not allowed uh, by some of our major financial uh, brands because the risk is, 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 is too high so Robert's right but it does depend on context.
Yeah. Yeah. Now, Paul, Paul Hayes has just uh, brought up an interesting point. I understand the need to protect consumers and understand that introducing friction. Uh, uh, I, however, I would suggest that single click payment systems uh, such as Apple Pay provide great convenience and also protect the customer, the consumer, as the payment details are not sent to the seller. And it also avoids allowing sellers to retain personal and payment details that are potentially vulnerable to hackers. Uh, interested in the views of the panel on that? Yeah, I think the, the question of the, the friction is it's very tricky to find the right balance because obviously we want um, online services to be inclusive and accessible. We want people to be able to do what they want. It to, we want it to be a user friendly experience. So I'm not suggesting that we put in you know lots of different steps to make it more difficult. I was more saying that this is how it influences consumer behaviour and decision making, that it's quicker to make decisions and then what the potential impacts of those might be. So I'm not necessarily saying we need to introduce more friction, but just it changes the dynamic basically of how you shop. I mean, I may not be the only person who's like bought hundreds of things online and then the next day wanted to send them all back. I don't. Chris, <laughs> um, just to say, we, we can learn from all the work that's happening around uh, gambling bank card blockers at the moment, and that's giving people the choice of friction with appropriate time locks on it. And I think it's um, Paul's absolutely right. Yeah, one click and one pay is, is fantastic. But um, some people would require uh, an increased level control and very much welcome that. Mm. Uh, anything, Nina, you want to add? I would say, I mean, the work that we've been doing around um, access to cash and people, um, some people being reliant on cash and the transition to digital payments, we think there are lots of options around digital payments um, that have been coming up over the last few years. Apple Pay is one of them. I think the, the key thing is uh, thinking about how digital payment options can be made more designed to be more inclusive in the first place. So those who are not comfortable using online payments, who um, feel, for example, say that loss of control or um, you know needing that friction, they're already starting to design different types of products to suit those needs as well. Um, but over and overall, yes, these sorts of payments and this innovation is a good thing. It's just taking everyone along on the journey with it. Uh, this might be one for you, uh, Nina. How should the UK regulators address cryptocurrency payments online? Mm. Oh, it's. A, I mean, that's a very, very new and technical issue. I think it's something we're still trying to understand ourselves in terms of how will this, what are the benefits of cryptocurrency and why would people want to move on to it? What can it lead to innovation in the kind of personal finance markets? And how does it interact with different services as well? So it can not only help you with your banking, but then also with your purchasing of products and services um, online. I think it's still something that we are trying to get a better understanding of, but it's something we would urge regulators to do as well, especially as we move into areas like online, ba um, online um, banking and open banking in the future. Um, I've been taken to task, and um, I don't. Uh, I absolutely dis uh, I absolutely agree with this point. Uh, the questioner says it's not often I disagree with Liz. Thank you. Uh, but I think it's a question that should be considered, and that's the trading standards question. As without access to the enforcers, how can consumer rights be properly upheld, particularly for the vulnerable consumer? I wasn't saying we shouldn't address it. I was saying that it was probably out with the scope of this uh, panel. And I do think that it is something that is exceedingly important. So I'm really sorry if there was any confusion there. I think that might be something that we might want to discuss uh, at uh, a later date. We have absolutely run out of time. There are so many comments that I would love to have got in. Digital empathy through AI, uh, says someone. Uh, government authorities should ensure senior citizens stay protected during transactional transactions online because they need caretakers to take them to physical markets, uh, which is a very interesting point. Um, why just senior citizens, says Anne, uh, not all have a caretaker, not best to generalise about particular sections of the community, and certainly that point is taken. You have 30 seconds each. One final thought. Chris. Uh, access, uh, control and friction. Okay. Nina, can you, can you beat that? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, transparency, prevention, effective uh, response and effective regulation. 
Thank you. And uh, Julie? As I'm the project leader on the Consumer Vulnerability International Standard, I want to raise the issue of inclusive design. I think it is important, relevant to a lot of things people were saying around disclosure and around um, different people's needs and translation. If um, online services are design designed to be inclusive, and that means AI and everything as well, then we're going to prevent problems from happening further down the line. Um, absolutely clear messages coming from our panellists. Thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, what can I say? Thank you very much for joining us. If we could give you a round of applause, uh, we definitely would. The slides, uh, just time for me to say that the slides and the presentations will be, the recording of the presentations will be made available. Uh, I think Sadie has already put that on chat. So if you would like to scroll through, that would be absolutely fantastic. Uh, I have written down all sorts of notes and I was going to sum up at the end, but unfortunately that's not going to happen as we've run out of time. Informed choice, I think is uh, one of the things that I am most interested in. Uh, the the uh, inclusion, inclusive design is something that you're going to hear an awful lot more of uh, over the coming year, partly because I chair something called Fair by Design. <laughs> so, and we, we are very, uh, very, very interested in that at the moment. And Chris, obviously, we're working with the Money Advice Trust on that. Uh, so, um, and consumer awareness, we always need to highlight. Please, if you would like to join uh, Julie's CPIN network, uh, please do let us know. And if you are out there and you're representing an organization that isn't already on the Consumer Council, the Consumer Forum Council, then please, please do get in touch with me. We would love to have you on board. We are fighting for uh, consumer protection, consumer rights, uh, to make sure there is no erosion of those as we go into next year and whatever untold chart, uncharted waters we happen to sail for the next 12 months. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Thoroughly enjoyed having you with us. I hope you've enjoyed the discussion. Um, keep the questions coming in. You never know, the panellists might come up with <laughs> some ideas after they've uh, gone away from here and had time to think uh, and we can pass on any pressing questions. Thank you all and thank you for your questions.